the first day I ever laced up a pair of boxing gloves and went to a gym, it felt like home. The world's watching and, and there's no lying, no faking, no excuses. In, in that 25 minutes of that fight, it's the truth. The truth, I'm addicted to that. Yeah. Your, your fire is felt. That's From the moment I walked into a gym and I started lacing up these boxing gloves, yeah. a thought of money was never on my mind. It was always to be the best. Everybody stand up and give it up to the one and only Dustin Poitier. What's happening? How you doing? Doing good, man. Good. Excited to be here, yeah. We're excited to have you. Everybody was looking forward to this. Uh, Dustin, you know, before, uh, we got a lot, I got a lot of things here to cover with you, with your history. But before we uh, get into it, the audience, just so you know who you're speaking to, uh, raise your hand again so he knows who you are. Anybody's a founder here that runs their own businesses, raise your hand. So these are founders. Anybody's a C-suite executive, CEO, you run your own business, maybe you're doing a million dollars or more, raise your hand. Any businesses you run, raise your hand. Okay, uh, any salespeople, if you run sales or sales leaders, raise your hand. From 150 different industries, just so you know who your audience is. Yeah. Nobody here can fight you and beat you up, so you're safe. I don't think <laughs> we're worried anyways, but I just want to put that disclaimer out there. I'm off today, I'm not fighting anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So Dustin, before we get started, for some guys that don't know your story, uh, and they don't know how you came up. You got a pretty crazy story yourself. If you don't mind taking a moment and sharing with everybody your story, that'd be great to just get started with that. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I don't know how far back I should start, but... Go from eighth grade. Go from when you were in school and, you know, some decisions you made and what you did. Go, go okay. all the way back. Yeah, so um, in eighth grade, I was <clears throat> getting in a lot of trouble, um, running with, with the wrong crowd of people. I um, ended up going to juvenile detention for a while. When I got out, I... I Started ninth grade and stopped, so I never graduated ninth grade. And um, was just kind of running around aimlessly without a goal, without something to work, work towards. And, and growing up, I always loved combat sports. And uh, At what age? Like how soon was it? As far back as I can remember. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I remember uh, getting excited, going to friend's house for Mike Tyson fights when he was fighting Holyfield. And I just always loved boxing. Boxing was, was what I wanted to do. Um, and, and eventually I met some guys at a boxing gym who were doing mixed martial arts. They were just working on their striking. And I went to their gym and the story's history, you know, it just snowballed into a career of fighting. But that, when I was younger and, and uh, when I dropped out of school, finding combat sports, the thing for me was when I was watching these guys fight, the grit and determination that they showed, I just for some reason knew I had that. Whatever that was, I knew I could do that. Didn't know if I could fight with the best guys in the world, but I knew I was willing to suffer more than the next guy. And you knew that at that I knew that. I knew that whatever they had, I had. What, how old were you when you got your first fist fight? First fist fight, uh, like a legit fight. I would probably say 13 years old, maybe. Do you remember that fight? I've had so many of them. <laughs> I've had so many of them. <laughs> so 13 years old, uh, if somebody was to say, you know, everybody has a reputation at that age. Some kid was the athlete, some kid's the good looking guy, some kid's the gangster, some kid's the guy that does baseball cars, video games. 13 years old, what was your reputation? The guy who did whatever he want. You know, I just d did whatever I want. I didn't really, not, not that that's a good thing or I'm boasting about it. I just, whatever I felt like doing, I did. Whether it was um, against the law or against my, my mother asking me not to, I just kind of did what I wanted to do. And I still do that these days, just much more focused and doing it the right way. That, <laughs> that same energy I had, I use it in the right way now. Very cool. Very cool. So when you're coming up at 13, at what point did you kind of get a feel that I think I can fight pretty good against some of these guys? What, did you have a moment where you're like, I think I can really compete with some of these guys? The first day I ever laced up a pair of boxing gloves and went to a gym and started sweating and just the camaraderie of the other, other guys in there fighting. And I just, it felt like home. That's where I wanted to be with those guys. And, and I mean, from that day, I, I never looked back and I completely changed my circle and, and changed my focus and kind of just got drowned and, and lost in that. And, and it's still that for me. What was that in Lafayette? Was it in New Orleans or was it, was it here? Lafayette. Lafayette? Yeah. Coming up. And who were some of the guys that were mentoring you? Was there any names? Uh, did you have gyms you went to where there was, you know, reputable boxers? So I went to a, a mixed martial arts gym. It was the only one in Lafayette at the time. But 
the, the, the TV show Ultimate Fighter. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Sure, of course. It was just starting to like be a big thing. That was like when Forrest Griffin fought and it was on Spike TV. Mm-hmm. One, of my, one of the guys from Louisiana got a call to be on the show. And when he came back, he opened his own gym. And me and all the guys who were at this other gym went, you know, we moved to his gym and I started learning from him. And he was uh, the first black belt in jiu-jitsu in Louisiana's history. And, and he's built a stable of incredible fighters. One, uh, his guys just won Tuesday night on Dana White's Contender Series. Oh, shit. And got a contract in the UFC. Wow. So, I mean, he, he was a huge part of my career. So legit, he, like he had a reputation. Oh, yeah. Okay. Was he also like a father figure, brother, like older brother guy? Like, you, you know, kind of yeah. in your direction as well? He was, I'm not sure how, old he, how much older he is. I would say at least seven, eight years older than me. But he had his stuff together. He went to, for Got me, it. you know, he went to college. He was running a business. Uh, he was married. So he definitely was a father figure. Got it. So good example. By the way, just so you know, uh, uh, you don't need to worry about your past. Many of us have similar pasts here. I'm a one point GPA kid in high school, divorced family. There was nothing going in the right direction. My savior was military. Instead of, you know, you went fighting, I went in the army. That was my direction. And then I got, I went in business. So at this point, it, it, what year would it be? Because I'm trying to see going back during that time was what? Pride was going oh, yeah. on? What so, were some so of the... UFC had just bought Pride around that time. Got it. So those big names like Rampage Jackson, yep. Van, Vandalay Silva, those guys were just coming over to the UFC. So it was an exciting time in uh, mixed martial arts. The IFL was really big back then. Wow, you're taking it back. So yeah. Holy moly. Because you're, you're what, are you, are you a January 16th, 89? What, what year is uh, your... Uh, January 19th, 89. January 19th, yeah. 89. So you're 30, 32 uh, two years old. Yeah. 32 years old, whooping some ass. How awesome is that, by the way, right? When you think about that. Freaking amazing. Okay, so, you know, you said you watched Tyson. Who else were some of the guys that you modeled? Were you... I, my mom, um, when, when the Muhammad Ali movie came out, Will Smith... We went, she brought me opening night just because she knew I, I was also very uh, big into the, how Muhammad Ali did what he, did what he thought was right against uh, everyone's judgment, you know, not going to war, getting his title stripped. That's powerful, you know, to put your foot down. So you respect it. I, I, I respect him. Who do you think is the modern day Ali right now? Who would you say is a Ali? Oh, man, the, the, the landscape of combat sports has changed so much. I, I can't put a name to that one. That's a tough one. So you got Tyson, you got Ali. By the way, I remember that movie when it first came out. Great movie. Will crushed it in that movie. You know, yeah. The whole story was fantastic. I think they're working on a Tyson movie right now. They're working on a Tyson yeah. movie right now. We had, we had Tyson on two weeks ago. We had an event at MGM Grand Arena, and we had Tyson at the event. And it was very uh, different kind of a uh, 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 hearing his story. And he told the story. He said, when I was nine years old, uh, I had $5,500 in my pocket because I was street fighting and I was knocking kids' fathers out at nine years old. He says, so I knocked out this kid, and this kid went and grabbed his dad, then I knocked his dad out. And he says, the first time I had a fight, he says, here's how I fought. He says, I closed my eyes and I went like this, and I saw the guy on the floor, and I'm like, oh shit, I can knock people out. Was there a moment where you were kind of like, I-, I can pack a punch? Just being in the gym and, and fighting the guys who were established already, guys who were professional fighters, and, and I was still an amateur, um, doing well, holding my own with those guys, I knew it. But like I said, before I even put those gloves on, I knew I can do this. You know, I just had, I just had, I was overconfident in it. But also, as I got older, I realized how much goes into this. Like, ignorance is bliss when you're that young. No I'm question. just going into the gym, thinking I'm going to beat everybody. And of course, you continue to grow and get better skill-wise, but you get humbled uh, through the process. So, so when the ultimate fighter, who, who was the ultimate fighter when you started first following it? So I remember there was, uh, who was the guy that, yes, yes. Oh, Diego Sanchez. Diego Sanchez. Wow, he used to be very entertaining. I remember watching him years ago. But who was the ultimate fighter back then when you were following it? It, it was uh, Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner. Got it. That's when it really blew up and, and, and UFC was on the map when that fight happened. So your route isn't necessarily UFC. You started off with, uh, what is it, extreme uh, uh, cage fighting? Am I saying? Uh, ult- WEC. WEC. And yep. you started there and... How, walk us through that because I think you had two fights there. The first one you actually lost, and yeah, then you the won first, the second fight. First loss, came, yeah. first loss in my professional career. And first loss in your professional career. Yeah, Who was it, that, that was a heartbreaker for me because fighting locally in Louisiana as a professional, I was I'm out, wasn't making a lot of money, but sponsorships and um, you know people knew me there, so we can fill out arenas and make I can make a little bit of money enough to support me and my wife because me and my wife. Um, 
we've been married 12 years and we, we bought a house when we were 19 years old. So I had a mortgage, you know, I had grown man bills and I was a young kid trying to fight and make money. Wow. You've been married 12 years. Yeah. And she's in a bag, no? Yeah. Yeah, I saw your wife in a bag. That's yeah. cool. Married 12 years at 19 years old. You guys are still together. That's, I mean, what's the secret sauce there? You know, you're all over every magazine, every TV, everywhere. How are you making your marriage work? I, I just got lucky and got the right one. You know, she's my best friend. And uh, I, think, I think I wouldn't have accomplished a lot without her. So. Awesome job. It's great. So you have the first fight. Sometimes if you're coming out and your first fight kind of doesn't go your way, can psychologically mess with you. Did it do anything to you or did the coach kind of come back and say, it's okay, it's not a big deal? Yeah, here's the thing. So I, I thought that the World Extreme Cage Fighting was a big organization. It was on TV. Um, you know, the championships were respected. And I was fighting on the local scene. I got a fight up in Canada, and that's what got me signed to the WEC. So I was so excited to go to Vegas for my first time, you know, traveling ac across the country to fight. I was going to be on TV. I get out there and I lose, and then I get my check. And, and I thought I was, gonna, I was here, I was going to make it. Life's about to change now. And then uh, medicals are deducted from my check. My, my coach's flights are deducted from my check. All, all these things. And, and I'm, I can't survive on this when I got the check. I was making more money fighting locally. So it was a heartbreaking moment for me. Wow. Yeah. So we got back home, reevaluated some things, and, and just kept my foot on the gas but yeah that was a heartbreaker my first loss uh, as a professional how big was the check can, can you was it a five no, ten thousand twenty thousand no it, i think i was making four thousand dollars to to show up the way fighting works with mixed martial arts at the beginning you get a show and a win if you win you get the other half of your purse so i was making like three or four thousand dollars i lost so i didn't get the other half and then everything was deducted you know as a young kid, I don't know how much flights really cost. Wow. They're booking. I'm letting them book my, my coach's flights. It's $600 for his flight, you know, and I have a few coaches. So I get my check, and I might have like 1200 bucks, and I got to fly back home and look at my wife. You know, we didn't even have money for her to go. I didn't even have money to, to get the hotel room, you know. And um, That's your first fight. That was my first loss as a professional. How, how did you not get, like, you're coming back. So you're coming back, and your wife is saying, babe. We, we didn't make no money on this one. Yeah, we lost money on this yeah, one. Yeah, so was there ever a time where you're like, I just don't think this is the world for me to be in. I got to go figure out another way to make money. Did you ever have that moment? There's been a few times in my career okay. where I've, I've had that you moment. You mind talking about those moments? Yeah, I, that, that was one of them. The first time I fought Conor McGregor was another one. I was close to a title shot. I was ranked in the top two in the world. And I went out there and got beat by a guy who was running his mouth and, and saying all these things, you know, um, and, and when I got back home, I was just like looking in the mirror, what, saying, what am I doing here? Like, what am, what's going on? I put everything I had into this, and I went out there and lost. And, and I just... That was, that was 2014? 2014. 2014. seven years. You were 25 years old at the time. Yeah. But I was on a, on a good streak. Like, it was me or him out. who yeah. were going to fight for oh, the yeah. belt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I took that loss, and that one really... They all, they all hurt. But just got back home, and, and I usually, when, when those things happen... I drown myself in the work, so I don't think about it. I just get back in the gym every day, working, grinding, and it takes my mind off of, off of those. Do, do you have another routine to stay mentally stable and calm? Like, uh, do you and your wife, do you say, babe, you can't talk to that guy, that guy's negative, you can't call this person, or hey, do you do reading books, audio, mute? What is your way of keeping yourself calm? In train or just in general? Just no, you're coming back. So I mean, your record is what 28 and six. Am I saying it correctly? Or, are, are you 20? Uh, what's your record? Your my professional record, I think, is 28 and six. Okay, so meaning, like you know, we run businesses, man. Not every decision we make, we take losses all the time. So there isn't anybody in that world that's not going to have their moment, except we got one guy, and that one guy. If he continues fighting, maybe somebody could get him. You know, we're talking about Khabib, right, outside of him. Yeah. But for the most part, everybody has eventually that they're going to take a loss. How do you process a loss? Because here's the difference that, that, gang, we have a different way of losing versus Dustin in his world. When we lose, is in an office. 19 people hear about a loss. You know what I'm saying? When yeah. we lose, oh, maybe people find that at a regional in front of 100 people. It's just that we're running a real estate company, right. whatever business. When you guys fight... The world is watching. The world is watching you. How do you manage that loss? I get back home and I try to, not only in fighting, but in my life. I make dumb mistakes all the time. And uh, in fighting, when I make a mistake that gets me caught or gets me in trouble and, and I lose a fight, I try not to make it again. That, that's, you know, being better than yesterday is, is my goal every day I wake up. 
and in, in fighting and in life, that's what I do. What led to this mistake? How can I tighten up and not do this again? Just try to learn from it, you know? And I, I, I try to live my life that way. Do you watch tapes? Like, do you sit there and you watch the fight after fight or no? You guys don't watch the fight. It, I have to let it breathe a little bit. Depends how it, how it, yeah. I have to let the emotions kind of get out of me so I can really digest what I'm watching and try to break it down. But me and my team will sit down and, and replay the fight and, and see things that we were doing wrong and we could do better, always. Is, is your, uh, the team that you have around you, are they those who are comfortable telling you the truth to say, Dustin, I don't know why you did this. You know not to do this. You did this three times with training. Do they talk to you pretty? Yeah. Like I, level of accountability is very open? Have to be in fighting because there's no lying in there. You know, it's not like, a, I don't know how it is in the, in the business office world. Like I can't, you might be able to cover some stuff with some whiteout and, and change some numbers here and there. The world's watching and, and there's no lying, no faking, no excuses. In, in that 25 minutes of that fight, it's the truth. And that's, honestly, that's the only thing I still love about this sport is that the fight is the truth. Because everything's so fabricated and online and people have opinions. It's just the truth. I'm addicted to that. Yeah, the truth is going to be revealed in that yeah. octagon. It's going to, everyone's yeah. going to know. You can talk all you want. Yeah. And those guys around me, you know, I don't have yes men around me. I, those guys cut, cut it straight. Very cool. That's great. So coming up, so you do your first two fights, and then UFC 2011, I think you start going into UFC. You're coming up. At what point did the world kind of realize this, this guy's legit. What was the one fight that you had where everybody started saying he's legit? I had a unique opportunity coming from the WEC. When I was signed to the WEC, UFC bought the company. So they merged all the fighters onto their roster. And a guy named Jose Aldo, if you're a fight fan, course, you know who yeah. legendary world champion Jose Aldo is. He was getting ready to fight a guy named Josh Grisby on a New Year's card in the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. And Jose hurt his neck. And they needed like a tune-up, keep the guy ready for when Jose's healthy. And they called me. And I actually got the call. I was in the gym training on the mats when I got the call. So I was in the right spot. And they, they asked me to cut down to 145 pounds for this opportunity to fight the number one contender. What were you at that time when they called you? I was fighting at 155 pounds, but I was probably 180 something. So you had to cut down 30, yeah. 35 pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th no, 120, uh, that's right, 25 pounds. Yeah. But when Dana White calls you and you're a young kid and this yeah. is going to be your first fight in the UFC, you, you say yes. 155 or 145? This one was 145. So you, I've never made that in my, in my, my career as a fighter, amateur or a pro, until that call. The, 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 when, when those fights happen, does a Dana call or does somebody on Dana's team call your camp and say, hey, is he ready to fight? Usually it's somebody um, in the office at the UFC, but on these kind of things, Dana will call. So Dana calls. And then who comes and tells you, hey, you got a big fight potentially coming I was, up? I was in the gym, so my coach, my buddy Tim, who was on the Ultimate yeah. Fighter, came and said, hey, it's happening. You're going to the UFC. And we kind of knew that because the company bought the WEC. Got it. So we knew we were going to be merged over, but I didn't know it was going to be that soon. You know, I might have had a few weeks to prepare. But I went in there. And you asked me when I felt like a, yeah. I got on yeah. the scene. I went in there, and I unanimous decision over the number one contender at 145 pounds. That's pretty sick, And made a big way. splash, yeah. And that's 10 years ago. You were 21 years old. Yeah. Guys, that's pretty insane to do something like that. Okay, so now you leave. Now you're saying, what's the, are you thinking, are you talking to you guys saying, hey, listen, the sky's the limit for us right now. What are you thinking at that moment? That win, out of all the wins, I've won the, um, the interim championship when I beat Max Holloway in Atlanta. Sick. Thanks. And uh, that, that first win, getting my hand raised in the UFC for the first time, is still one of the best feelings, most memorable feelings that I've had because I always thought I could compete with those guys. But to go in there and beat the number one contender on short notice, I felt like everything was stacked against me. It really felt like, all right, like I can do anything here. I, I can be the world champion. I mean, of course. I mean, if you're going at a, <laughs> with a guy like that at 21 years old, you're not even at your prime yet. Yeah. What age in this business is prime? We, Everybody's different genetics. Yeah. But for me, the way I look at it is uh, you start off with – your athletic ability to be high. Okay. And, and fighting is so mental. It's, it's not only your skill set in fighting. Everybody punches hard. Everybody's fast at this level. We're all great athletes. Everybody works their ass off. It, it's, there's, a, there's a prime moment where the athletics here and the mind's here, and, and you start to age, and, and it comes down, and, and when they even out, that, that's when you're in your prime, and everybody's different, but now is my time right now. You're at your prime right now. Yeah, you're looking at it. So... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. So right now, like, 
you know, who do you think you can go up against and win? Is there any, is there any fight that you would like to see happen where you're fighting? I'm just waiting on the contract. It looks like I'm going to be fighting for the lightweight world championship December 11th in Las Vegas. Yeah. And it's against? Against Charles Oliveira. Really? Yeah. That's not, it's not been signed yet, though. It's not been signed yet. They actually leaked the news yesterday, so it's starting to get out there. But uh, I've agreed to it. December 11th, I'm going to be the world champion. Very cool. Well, we're definitely looking forward to that. So now, the fight when you won uh, uh, with the Aldo fight, was that actually the first one where you got a little bit of money? Did you get a taste of money there or no? Yeah, so that was the biggest payday I've had to that point. And I just remember going home. I think we uh, paid off my wife's car. I didn't have a car at the time early in our career. My, I used to ride a bike to the gym. Sick. My wife would bring me or I'd borrow my mom's van and go. It was just crazy, you know. But uh, paid off the car, got ahead, and, and put some money in the bank. And then just it's been that ever since, trying to do it the right way. It's amazing. That's, that's great to see. So, okay, so then... Uh, now you have the fight that uh, is coming up in uh, 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 December. You said December is going to be the, the card. December 11th. Yeah. And uh, uh, with all the stuff that's going on, there's a few characters I'm curious about with you. So one, you fought a lot of different guys, okay? Uh, and you fought different styles of guys in, uh, in uh, UFC. Who to you, you say, when this guy punches, it's the heavy. He packs a punch. Who's above everybody? I know we can say everybody packs a good punch. Right. Was there anybody that you said, I felt this guy's punch? Conor McGregor, no doubt about it. You put Conor at the top. Yeah. That, as the best, biggest puncher I fought? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, He's special, a special individual for sure. Wow. And, and you fought him what? You fought him uh, 14 and then 21-21. Fought him in 2014. Lost. And that was on his, you know, when his trajectory was mm -hmm. just, sky was the limit. He was on his way up. And he tore through everybody, became a two-weight world champion. But, yeah, and I fought him twice this year. So this year when you get the first fight, the second fight, the third fight, do you feel any different when he packs his punch or is it still the same? Still the same, very dangerous. Okay. It's just I, I've, I've felt differently mentally going into it. You think the biggest difference between you and 14, 21 is mental or is it skills as well? Some areas where you saw some weaknesses where you can exploit? For sure, my skills got better over the years. You know, all the work wasn't done in vain, but my mental side is, is what lost me that first fight, you know, and, and what won me these last two fights. That's two fights. Uh, uh, ground, if you were to say somebody who you went up against, went up against that ground game is just Khabib, ridiculous. Khabib Nurmagomedov, yeah. Would you put him like in a league of his own? A lot of people call him as a league of his own type of guy. Would you put Never him? felt anything like it, you know, and I have 46 fights. I've fought all kind of different people, all kind of different styles. Been around the world training in gyms. This guy... This guy's good. What's, what's unique about it? Tell us about it. His understanding of his weight distribution, where my weight needs to be to keep me up, to, to build back up, and, and, and his understanding of uh, grappling is, is impressive. Is, I mean, the best I've ever felt, the best I've ever seen. You know, the guy's 30 and 0. In MMA, that's a hard thing to do. There's so many variables, there's so many ways to lose. And to be 30 and 0 against the best guys in the world is, you know, very impressive. But his understanding of what I needed to do and what positions I needed to be in um, to advance, he, he, was just, he was steps ahead of me. If, if he decides, let's just say you win in December, hypothetically, you win, fight is over, in your mind you're gonna win the fight, so that's over with. Okay, so now Dustin's the guy. Mm -hmm. You're everywhere, right? I'm talking every freak, there's, everybody has to come through you, you call the shots. If he wanted to, and you guys fought in 2022, how confident are you if you went up against Khabib? I'm very confident. I can beat anybody in the world. Anybody in the world. But at the same time, I'm honest with myself and I understand this is combat sports and, and I can lose to anyone as well. But my skill set, I, I believe 100% in my skill set and work ethic, I can beat anyone. Yeah. It's exciting to be in that state. And you know, what makes you unique is your level of humility. So in, in, uh, 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 in the, what's been happening a lot lately is with Jake, uh, Paul, Tyrone Woodley. I don't know if you saw the fight. Oh, you I, were I at, the, at fight. the fight. Yeah. I saying? You were at the fight. I saw you were everywhere. Yeah. What did you think about the fight, Jake against uh, Tyrone? I thought Tyrone was going to do a lot, a lot better than that. You know, he's been in the gym for the last 15 years fighting, training mixed martial yeah. arts. He's a former world champion. Um, but he's, not a he's a big puncher, but he's not a boxer. The art of boxing is, is different. It, it, it's, um, it's a different thing. You think if you, like, let's, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying if you did fight these guys as a boxer, is there any chance they can go up against you if they box you? I think I beat all these guys in boxing. Every one of these guys. Yeah, these, these um, social media you, guys social crossing media over. Guys. Yeah. Yeah, I, I punished them. 
Yeah. <laughs> Confident. Look, it's not even like a thought. I'm not being cocky, but I know you're not being. This cocky. is how it's I feed my family, yeah. and, and I've grown up in the gyms and, and yeah. become a man in these gyms um, under the pressure and fire of fighting. So when I speak about fighting, I speak about it strongly because I care about this stuff. No, it's, very, it's by the way, just so you know, it's felt. Your your fire is felt. That's not. You can't act that way. It's very natural. So Max. Max, uh, uh, you know, historically is known as being one of the better boxers in, yeah. uh, in the MMA. And you went up against him twice, and you won both times. And the second fight you guys had, sick fight. I mean, we should have paid $300 to watch <laughs> that fight. It was that sick of a fight. What is it like fighting Max? Max is a guy who um, his pace is hard to keep up with. Fortunately for me, I, I, I work hard and build my aerobic capacity and, and, and uh, my cardio and muscle endurance, but I have a, a natural gift. I'm thankful for it, but I, I can be out of shape off the couch and go to the gym and outlast a lot of these guys physically. I don't know how, why. I'm, it's just the way my body's wired, so I'm thankful for that. So I was able to keep up with his pace and uh, make him make mistakes. You know, he was the current world champion at the time. He moved up in weight, and I, and I beat him. Um, but in there, I felt his understanding of combat sports, and, and I felt his knowledge and, and his skill set. He's an incredible fighter. If you, if you were to put, of all the people you fought, I'm a dog fight type of person, who would you put at the top? Not best puncher, mm -hmm. not ground. I'm talking dog fight. Like, this guy's not going to stop. He's relentless. Who would you put at the top? That I've faced? Yeah. Max has to be at the top. You know, I've hit him with, I hit him with so many shots. He was hurt multiple times. Um, an another one at the, at, at the, on that list is Justin Gaethje. I mean, the guy's a wrecking ball. He, he walks forward with reckless abandonment for his own body and his own health to, to, to land his shots. But that's why he's such a fun fighter to watch. Very cool. You think Connor's going to make a comeback? That injury, man. You know, he broke the tibia and fibula. Yeah. That's going to be a long road. But look at all the things the guy's accomplished. If anybody can come back from that, it, it's him. You know, I wish him. I don't, I don't hate any of these guys. Uh, it's very obvious. Um, yeah. All the stuff said and, and the, you know, he, he could. He could. You know, he's a former multiple-time multiple world champion, and he knows how to work. He has money. He has a team around him. So if he wants to build it back up, he has all the, the things to do that. How do you stay motivated when you're getting paid as much as he's getting paid? I don't know, man. They say it's hard to wake up and run those miles and, when you sleep in the silk pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Has that happened to you yet? Have you made that kind of money? Like, have you made the money money yet? Do you feel like you're at a point right now where... You feeling pretty confident about where you're at financially? Yeah, me and my family are in a great spot. And, uh, but I still ha have things to do. I, I still have things to do. I'm not there yet. I, I have one more box to check on my career. The ribbon on top of my mixed martial arts career is be the undisputed world champion. That's what I want. That's what I, bef fr from the moment I walked into a gym the first time in my life and I started lacing up these boxing gloves, yeah. I, I thought of money was never on my mind. It was always to be the best. And I'm still climbing that mountain, you know. You, you, you got a guy like Tom Brady that's, how old is he right now, 68? I don't know how old he is. I think he's, uh, <laughs> he's like 44. Is he 43 or 44? What, 44? And he's still, you know, going out there, kicking some ass, and it doesn't look like this guy's going to stop. Do you have a number? Like, do you say, I think I'm going to go till this age? Or is it, you know, the, the diplomatic answer, well, we're going to see, we're going to take it one day at a time, we're going to talk to the family and see? That, that's kind of the way I've been through my whole career, but I always thought I wouldn't fight past 35, but... At 35 is almost, you know, I'm 32. Yeah. I was saying that when I was 19, 20 years old. Then you turn 32 and you're like, well, I still feel pretty good. 35 is not that old, you know. But we'll see. I, I, I want to be the world champion. That, that's the goal. And as long as I can compete with these guys, wake up feeling good. Of course, I have aches and pains. I've been fighting a long time. But as long as I can compete with these guys, I don't see why, why, why I wouldn't. It, 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 who do you see right now that's coming up? Younger guys that's coming up where you say, that, guy, that guy's got a future. He can be a killer. But the young guy's coming up, like the 21-year-old version of you. Is there any guys you're seeing where you're... There are so many guys like that. Um, I, I trained at American Top Team in Coconut Creek when I'm getting ready for mm -hmm. my fights. Mm -hmm. not far from here. And there, there's just so many guys. The, but, but also, when I was 21 in, in the gyms, the sport wasn't nearly as big as it is now. So the amenities these gyms have, the coaching staff that these guys have, we didn't have that back then. So I'm just seeing the level of fighting getting so much better. You know, it, 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 the guys are starting at 16, 15 years old, younger than that, doing jiu-jitsu, boxing, doing mixed martial arts. Back then, we had to, there wasn't a mixed martial arts gym. We had to go to a boxing gym, find a jiu-jitsu gym, 
travel across town and try to put all the stuff together ourselves. Mixed martial arts is becoming its own martial art now. You, you have to be able to do everything. And these kids are doing that from an early age. So I'm just seeing the level gr grow so fast with these young guys, man. They're, they're incredible. You, you think UFC is going to pass up boxing eventually, where it's going to be just more exciting to watch UFC and boxing is going to become a thing of the past, or you think boxing is always going to be able to hang? I mean, boxing's been around forever. I think UFC is gaining a lot of uh, traction with combat sports fans in the, in the past few years. It, it might be that. It might be at that point right now, you know? But th those big fights, the heavyweight championships of the world, you know, Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, those kind of fights are always going to be prestigious. No You're always going to want to see true. those fights. Yeah. But the overall week-to-week, month-to-month fighting, I think UFC or mixed martial arts in general is doing bigger things than boxing is. Yeah, I think, I think many people would agree with you. How much of that do you think is Dana, where he had the startup mentality of a barbarian CEO, you know, coming up and building that thing up? How much of it do you think it's more, you know, the fighters coming up? Like, what kind of credit do you give for Dana, what he's done? They did an incredible job of building the company up to, to what it is now, um, cashing out on it. You know, yeah, with three and a half billion, that was a nice payout. I think they bought it for two million. So yeah, they bought it for two for four million. billion. Whatever Crazy. it was. Good for them, though. Yeah. That's the best part. The guy who, you know, the guy that started it, I don't know if you know this or not, maybe it's your world. His original plan was to create a cage fight with sharks swimming around yeah. it. Did you know that story? Yeah. With, I mean, can you imagine you go to a fight, there's <laughs> sharks swimming around. It's kind of a little weird, but you got a Dana comes in with two of his investors, they buy it out, and the rest is history. Yeah, I think a little bit of it for sure is Dana, his marketing ability, his, his thoughts that he, he, he made this to what it is, but the fight sells itself because it's so exciting. That, like I was talking about variables, there's so many ways to win and lose in mixed martial arts that, that it, it's hard to, to get a boring fight. Did, did, you, did you follow basketball growing up? Are you a guy that followed baseball, basketball, football? or Football. Not really? Football, you yeah. did? Okay, so... Who was the commissioner when you were following football before Roger Goodell? Who, uh, are you, did you follow a lot of the commissioner stuff? Or no, not? I didn't follow okay. the commissioners. So uh, uh, Dana White, what's his relationship with the fighters? You know, and, and here's what I mean by that. Is, it, is he the boss boss? Like, hey, this guy's the boss. We got to make sure we're going based on what he's saying. Does he build a relationship? Is he his friendship guy? Does he tell you the truth behind closed doors? You didn't show up today. I don't know what that was all about. If you fight like this, you ain't going to get the big fight. What's his yeah. relationship with fighters? He's honest like that. Okay. If, if you go out there, leave it all out there, don't play it safe, he'll bring you back. He, he's a pretty you know, cut, dry, honest guy when it comes to that type of stuff. I haven't spent a whole lot of time in, um, you know, with him. I've gone to Vegas a few times and cut some deals where he had to sit down with the lawyers and stuff like that. Uh, other, other times it's just been at events, behind the scenes, you know, quick chats. But he, he's honest uh, in person. The, uh, Dana is. Yeah, you almost see like the way he uh, deals with the fighters. He seems forgiven, but he also seems like he's got a pretty high standards on the way he sets it up. As long as you go out there and fight as hard as you can, you're in a good spot with Dana. You're in a good yeah. spot with Dana because <laughs> he gets the eyeballs. So crazy question for you. Just crazy question. This is just for my own interest. It probably has nothing to do with the guys here. If, if Dana, if let's just say it comes to a time where Dana wants to retire or walk away, who does Dana's job? That's a tough, tough spot to fill. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think uh, Daniel Cormier, maybe. Maybe somebody who's been in combat sports. I don't know if he knows a whole lot about the business side, but I, I think he would be a great face of a, of a company. Daniel so, Cormier? Yeah. Is, is Daniel going to be able to poke and challenge like, uh, like uh, uh, Dana does? You think Daniel could do? Because, you know, Dana's like, he will steer the pot because he knows, like, even the... One of the best things I like to watch is his uh, uh, post-fight conferences. So uh, ticket uh, sold out, 16,208. Pay-per-view buys, boom. Uh, fight of the night is this, questions. And then yeah. he goes and he says, well, I wasn't too impressed. I thought the judges this. What sport boxing do you ever see people talking about the judges sucked? Everything's yeah. about protect the judges and the referees. He goes straight after the judges. For right? sure. Yeah, interesting guy. Can you see Conor ever doing what he does? Say, Conor? Conor. I don't know if, uh, I, I can't speak on it. I guess he could. He, he, I guess he could. A personality like Conor, because Conor is, you know, uh, he's a great fighter, but the guy's a great smack talker as well. Yeah. He's, uh, but leading a company, I'm not sure if you'd want that, you know. 
Got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Being the face and the voice of a company might, might get out of hand here and there. Yeah, so you need a diplomatic guy that's, that's yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, thinking. Maybe yeah. a little bit of Daniel. Somebody who Gordon. stands their ground but doesn't cross the line. I think that's cool. And Daniel definitely stands the ground. He's yeah, not up yeah, against very everybody. Well spoken. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, so we've talked about Dana. We talked about a lot of those things. Uh, your business venture. So this, uh, you fighting has also opened up a lot of different opportunities for you. You now have businesses, you hot sauce, you got charities. Can you talk about what some of the projects you're working on today? Yeah, the hot sauce, I've all, I love cooking and I always wanted to have some space in the culinary world. And uh, during the last year, during the pandemic, when we were at the beginning of like March, you know, when we were locked in the house, that's when I, I started putting pen to paper and, and jotting down ideas and, and finding people who I can link up with who were respected in that industry. And we put it together and, and, and we launched it um, January of this year. And it's doing very well, man. The, the hot sauce. Yeah, I got a bunch of them out of office, by the way. Yeah? Yeah, yeah we got the hot sauce. It's Thanks. great. Yeah. yeah. So hot sauce is purely because you're cooking. Yeah, I'm cooking. I love to cook, but I'm also from Louisiana, and, and we take our hot sauce serious in Louisiana. Very, you know? yes. It's like a religion over there. Yeah, yeah. Louisiana hot sauce is a special thing, and I wanted, and, and I was just home and, and during the pandemic and saw an opportunity to, to get in <laughs> the culinary world. Dustin, how much does, uh, does you winning in your world that you're in, in the, in the UFC MMA world that you're in, how much does this create additional opportunities for you outside of the world? How it, much have you seen that happen? It, it's huge, you know, because I'm already have a spotlight with these fights and the build up with these fights. And for hot sauce, um, guys eating wings, watching fights, the demographic that's following the sport and, and my fan base, it was just a great timing and, and a great thing. Um, it was a, it, I knew it was going to be a, a win f from the jump. And um, my star in the UFC not only raises that with the sales of the hot sauce, but it also gives me a platform to speak about my charity and to speak about the things we're working on. And I, I want to take advantage of that, you know. And when the UFC moved over to ESPN, I was excited because I knew that just I, I had a, me a bigger megaphone now to get these goals with my charity out. But definitely me fighting has created opportunities, no doubt about it. Do, do you think if you would have tried to do the hot sauce and the charity when you're not in the top five or the top ten, it would have had the same impact as it does today? Do you think there was an element of timing, like let's wait to do this when we got a bigger platform and then let's launch it? Yeah, I, I, I really believe that. All, at this time, you know, I'm fighting in the biggest fights of the year. All eyes are on me. So I really have an opportunity to take advantage of that and and so many more people are hearing the news about what we're doing with charity or hearing the news about the hot sauce just way more eyes on me and, and what I have going on yeah it's very big because a lot of times guys will you know try to do everything at the same time too early before they're way too big and then you you, you don't have that big of a impact right. because you can't you don't have the eyeballs on you yet rather than let me go win here first and then I can do the all the other you know ancillary whatever additional things that I want to do and then sometimes these become bigger than this yeah yeah, so it looks like that's, that was kind of your strategy. Yeah, I, I just, it was a perfect timing. Like you said, perfect timing. Fantastic. Uh, a couple other questions before uh, we finish up also talking about your charity is coming up, when you were coming up, were there guys, and the only reason I'm asking is because sometimes in business, there's a lot of people that are here, these guys all from across the world, you know, got people here from Netherlands, Qatar, here all across the country. Sometimes you're coming up and there are some guys that are better than you. Maybe you fought somebody that had the ability to be a champion one day, maybe get at your level one day, and you kind of saw them drift away. Was there any instances like that where you saw some guys that could be fighters, but they kind of uh, made some mistakes and they, you know, nothing ended up happening with them? We don't know about their stories? Yeah, I do. What were some of the, can you, not, not specific stories, but if you don't mind sharing a couple examples. There was one guy, I, um, there's a documentary called Fightville. It it's, follows me since I was a young fighter, an amateur fighter. Kind of shows my journey to the UFC, but the name that comes to mind when you're talking about guys who went on a different path is, is a guy in that uh, documentary who was a tough fighter, you know, hard worker, but just couldn't see. He, he could have done it. He could have been there. He could have made money. He could have been a world champion. He could have just couldn't seem to pull it all together and be consistent. And, and, and I saw him go down a different road, you know, but he had what it took. When you say different road, what do you mean he couldn't put it all together? Meaning he couldn't stay d disciplined? Was it uh, association? Was it he couldn't get rid of the bad friends? Was it... All of that. All of the yeah, above. all of those things. Yeah. Is, is there a... Is there a uh, like when I'm talking to Mike and I'm saying, hey, 
he says, you know, when Mike Tyson talks about the fact that my son says he wants to be a boxer, I said, what do you mean you want to be a boxer? You live in a multi-million dollar house, you, you don't have what it takes to be a boxer. What are you talking about? Go back to school. I didn't grow up going to a private school. You do, right? Like he has that conversation with his son. Do you see a, a common trend with guys who end up becoming killers in your world do they have similar upbringing? Like, do you see a trend with that? Yeah, I, I, I think from my point of view too, it's, there's not a lot of people who fight just because they want to fight. You know, this fighting is scary, it's um, nerve wracking, it's dangerous. There are people out there obviously who, who do it and can be successful, but most of the time fighters are, are you're fighting because you have to. You're fighting your way out of something, fighting for your family to have a better, you know, uh, way of life. You're fighting just to, to make a name for yourself. So uh, a lot of these guys in these gyms that I've noticed are, are guys from similar backgrounds, you know, made some bad mistakes, found a way to, that they can work with their hands and, and, and make a name for themselves. You know, all these guys are, are blue collar, hard workers for the most part. And um, they, uh, they didn't have a choice. They fought their way, you know, literally uh, into a better life. And I see that across the board, whether it's boxing or mixed martial arts. You, you don't, it's not like you're, you're playing football and you, you need pads and a helmet and all you need to do is wake up and have oh. hands and, and you can shadow box, you can go for a run, you can start working on skills. You don't need a lot of equipment, a pair of gloves and, and you're, you're on your way to start training. And I, I just think that too is part of people, um, you know, you don't need a lot of money to start learning how to fight. So there's an edge to the blue collar mentality, right? You have to. Big edge when you're coming up, you don't have anything, you're around, you know, you're in the streets, you see stuff that others are not going to see. Yeah. It's almost like the survival of the fittest type of deal. Right. And you can, and it's something special because you can literally fight your way out of whatever, you know, life has, has whatever hand you've been dealt, you can literally fight your way punch by punch into a better life. Yeah. Do you have any kids? I have one daughter. How are you going to pass that down to your kids? How do you pass down the blue collar mentality? So that's the thing you just said, like yeah. your buddy lives in a, yeah. a multi-million dollar house. I don't want my daughter to fight. You know, I don't want to see my daughter. Well, are you guys planning on having more kids? Yeah. Okay. So let's just say you have a son. Like you, I, how do you pass it down to him? I, I'd rather him go to, go to college. Got, and, got and But uh, we'll see what happens. I'll never tell, like, try to direct them away from it, but I don't want to see that. I, I, but I'm a, I will try to pass on the lessons I've learned through fighting because I've learned so much about myself um, through victory, through losses, through business. And I've been in rooms that I would have never been in, sitting across from, from people I would never be in front of if I never put on a pair of boxing gloves. So I'm thankful for that. That's cool. It's going to be, so, so your kids, if your son says, Dad, I want to be like you when I grow up. I want to do UFC. I want to do MMA. What do you tell the kid? I'm not sure, man. We, I, uh, <laughs> we'll crazy. take it one day at a time. We'll take it one day at a time. You know what? I don't even want to think about that conversation right now, Pat. So, but, you know, uh, going back to uh, uh, the UFC, you know, the, uh, as a whole, as an industry, are you a fan yourself? Are you a guy that also watches all the fights like you enjoy? Oh, yeah. I yeah. watch everything. Always have been. Who do you like? Like, who is, who's your favorite, you know, fighters of all time in the, in the UFC? I used to be a huge fan of George St. Pierre. He's one of the guys who can do it all. You know, and back around when he was really starting to rise up, yeah. they had a lot of guys, a guy was a grappler or a guy was a wrestler mm -hmm. or this guy's a kickboxer. He was one of the first guys who really put everything together and was a complete mixed martial artist, world champion, held himself, you know, spoke well, and uh, I was a big fan of George. St. Pierre. You put him on Mount Rushmore? Is he on Mount Oh, Rushmore? yeah, he's on Mount Rushmore. Who's, who's, MMA who's on your Mount Rushmore? You got, is it Khabib and him and who else? Khabib's up there. Fedor is up there. Fedor. Fedor of Milinanko, wow. yeah. Fedor's got to be up there. Uh, man, Fedor John is, Jones has to be up there, too. Yeah, so so you that's know? the four. Yeah. Those are the four. Anybody here watch Fedor fight or no? Who, who doesn't know? Yeah. So you guys don't know who Fedor is? Oh, my gosh. Fedor was, you could watch this. If you just go type in Fedor, F-E-D-O-R, you will be stuck to YouTube for a couple hours. This guy's fights were legit. Remember the fight with Randleman? Yeah, when he slammed, did he slam him? Yeah. Yeah, slammed. yeah. Fedor got slammed on his head. He got slammed on his neck. You're thinking the guy's yeah. dead. Yeah. Dude, they build him different in Russia. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> in Russia. Awesome. Well, why don't we talk a little about your charity, and then we're going to have some of the guys ask some questions here, and then we'll go from there. So talk about your charity if you don't mind. My charity, uh, me and my wife lived in Florida here in, in Boca Raton for five years, and then my daughter was born. We moved back to Louisiana because I wanted to raise her with family. But... Um, 
when we were moving, I had these drawers full of fight-worn gear over the years of fights, like my first win in the UFC, my first win in the WEC, fights that just meant these, these, these things just meant something to me. And it's cool when you have one or two or three, but when you have 40-something fights and your drawers are just full of bloody gloves and clothes, it's not cool anymore. It's kind of gross. And we were, we were moving and packing up a U-Haul, and we are like, what are we going to do with all this stuff? And we were just thinking, talking, and we decided to auction some stuff off and donate the money to a fallen officer who had just passed away in the line of duty right near uh, where my wife and I went to school in Louisiana. So we did that, and then we did it again, did it a few more times. And I was just doing that out of my name. Like, Dustin donates the money, Dustin does it. And, and I was in training camp one, one day, and we were talking, and we wanted to see if we can give it its own identity and... and turn this into an actual charity. So it's not Dustin does this, Dustin does that. We can turn it into a, something that has its own name and see if it can grow organically and other people can get behind it. And my goal was to have other fighters donate their fight war memorabilia and we can auction it off or, or sell it and do things in their communities too. And we started the Good Fight Foundation. And since then, we've done some amazing things I'm very proud of. We're uh, currently building housing in Uganda right now for the Pygmy people. Uh, we teamed up with Manny Pacquiao for that goal. Awesome. Uh, Justin Wren as well. Yeah, so that, and we don't have one specific goal. We do, all, we do all kinds of things. Whatever we see, we can help in the, in the community or wherever. It's a good fight foundation. And that's your 501c3. That's my 501c3. Awesome. I got and, and also, I have no, no background in, in starting a business or building a website. So me and my wife are in training camp um, on a laptop computer trying to build this website for the foundation we're just starting and it, it's been a learning thing man you know we we, we was running like a mom and pop shop at the beginning <laughs> but it's it's cool because we have full control of everything we have still no paid uh no payroll we haven't paid anybody there's no no employees of the foundation it's just me my wife two of our friends from louisiana and and we've doing some amazing things i'm very proud of it's great well i got a gift for you at the end uh, uh, that I'll, I'll announce it in front of everybody and Maybe we'll do something special for Dustin here. But what I'd like to do is open it up. Leo, we have the mic, CEOs. So you got a question. Cody, tell us, what question do you have for Dustin? We got 15 minutes to go through questions here, and Leo's walking like a turtle, but it's great. We'll figure it out. Thanks, Leo. So Rose Namajunas had this, uh, I may not pronounce her name right, but she had this like tradition she does where she says, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, which I love that clip, by the way, and I'm sure a lot of people that watch UFC saw that. Uh, do you do anything like this personally? I, I don't chant anything, but I do have a, a routine I do during fight camp is I, I for, for my mental focus, that might get her in the zone. What gets me in the zone is I, I write down the date of the fight on a piece of paper. I draw a circle around the date of the fight, and inside that circle, I write everything I have control of, you know, my diet, my, uh, my accountability, my... my my commitment to, to training, um, just everything that I can control. And outside of that circle, I write everything I can't control. Sick. You know, in, inside that circle is my thoughts, my work ethic, my commitment. Outside that circle is opinions, critics, uh, the media, my opponent. And, and I'll just go to that page in my book throughout, periodically throughout my training camp and on fight week and look at it. And I know I'm in a good spot because all the stuff outside of that circle doesn't matter. That's just noise. The only thing I can focus on and, and affect are the things inside of that circle. So as long as I'm doing that, I'm doing the most I can, doing everything I can. So I just make sure that the inside of that circle is taken care of. That's, That's phenomenal. Thank you. Unbelievable. Yes. John. Awesome. So to break that down even more, what are some routines and habits that you have preparing for a fight? And then what are some routines and habits you do recovering from a fight, and part two of that, or what are some distractions that are coming up while you're preparing for the fight? I'll tackle that part first. The distractions are um, just the, the, the media and the critics, and you know, social media is such a toxic place, but it's a place that I have to be because I need to promote these things. I have businesses, so I have to be on there. I don't have to read all the comments and all this, but you still see them. You know, so, so that's always a big distraction. People saying, and, and especially in fighting, we're, um, we're preparing to fight each other and you got your opponent chirping all the time, saying crazy things. Th those things really used to get under my skin, and, 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 but I do the circle thing now and I just focus on what I can't control. So all those things that I'm reading are out of my control. Um, 
distraction besides that you know just just the just the noise on the outside of that circle it it, it kind of distracts me every now and then but i can refocus on the center and, and the first part of the question holding myself accountable showing up every day even on bad days even days i don't want to go in I, I show up uh waking up and running the miles you know checking the boxes you know doing everything i think i need to do to be the world champion as, as long as I do those things, I mean, whatever's going to happen after that is just going to happen. But I'm going into these fights. I'm walking down this, this road into the unknown as prepared as I, I think I can be. You have a set schedule? Oh, yeah. Yeah, when I'm in training camp, I have a set schedule. We usually start at eight weeks, and we have different phases, and it phases into uh, peaking for the fight. Interesting. Similar to bodybuilding, by the way. Very interesting. Let's go here to Joanna, and then uh, I'm going to go to a couple guys here on the CO side, and I'm, maybe I'll come to some of you. Is that tomorrow or no? Maybe I'll come to you. Hey, Dustin. I'm a big fan, so thanks for coming. Um, in the last fight with Connor, you said the initial leg injury happened really at the beginning of the first round, so he actually kicked you and you blocked the leg, right? And then second time, close to the first round, the end of the first round, he used the leg again to follow through with the punch, right? And then obviously the fight ended because of the injury. Did you hear anything? Did you feel anything when you blocked the leg? Or how did you know that's when it happened? And the second question is, He's talking smack again, saying he's going to fight you again. Are you really going to fight him again for the fourth time? I mean, I will if uh, he can heal up. and <laughs> If he can what? I didn't hear it. If he can heal up. If he can heal up. Got it. And they can add some commas on, on, the, on the check. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't hear it break. Or I didn't even know it was broken until the end of the round when I looked down and it was kind of uh, dangling. Yeah. But... I've just been throwing kicks for so long, so many thousands of kicks I've thrown and, and received that I know when a kick lands bad. I didn't get a full check on his kick, but my, I turned my, my leg outward, and his shin bone hit my knee, and I knew it hurt him. That's why at the beginning of the fight I pointed at his leg, and I knew it hurt. I didn't know it broke, but I knew it hurt. I honestly think that it fractured then, and then later on it, it, he twisted or something, and the bone, yeah, broke. But I, did, I didn't know it was broken until the, the end of that round when he was holding his leg. Have you ever had that happen in a fight to you before or no? That was the first time. I've, yeah, the first time something that bad. You know, of course, broken noses, uh, sure. broken hands, yeah. things, things like that. But I've never seen me personally in a fight where somebody's disfigured like that. Historically, who's recovered from that? Anderson Silva um, fought again, you know, fought two or three more times after breaking his leg. He broke it after he kicked it. Like he... I fought on that card as well. Yeah, he, he, he broke it, the same kind of thing that I think fractured yeah. his leg, but it was broke all the way through there. Yeah, that was, I remember that fight. I remember that fight. Let's go over here. Let's go over here. Go to one more seal right here, right there, Director of Ops. Hey, Justin, two questions. So one question, uh, I saw you running with this like mask, like oxygen or something, what is that? That was an oxygen, it was an altitude simulator. So it, pulls a little bit of the oxygen out of the, out of the air that you're breathing in through this machine, so your body's running on less, less oxygen, and you're getting fatigued a lot quicker. And the second question is, uh, so I saw you saying in one of the interviews that before you come into the octagon, you're praying that you, you don't hurt like the other person like too much, but are you like, when you come to the octagon, are you like ready to die? Like, are you ready to like fight till the... Yeah, I, I always pray that me and my opponent come out and go home to our family safe, because what we do is very dangerous. But when I walk and my feet touches that canvas, I'm willing to die in there, yeah. I'm How willing do you, to do whatever it takes to, to, to be victorious. Yeah, I am. How do you not love this guy? Like, seriously, <laughs> he can kick your ass, but you love the guy. Right there. Right but that, there. That, on, that part scares me as well. You know, I, I wouldn't sit up here and say I'm not scared to death of making that walk. But I make it every time, you know, and, and when I get in there, I'm, I'm willing to, whatever's going to happen, I'm willing to go through, so. Does your, does your wife watch your fights or no, when it's happening live or no? Yes, she does. Are you comfortable watching them? I didn't have a car. My, I have 46 fights. My first fight was 2006 or 2007. Yeah. I didn't have a car. She drove me to my first fight. She, she's been to, she watches all my fights. Wow. Good for you. Seriously. Kudos. Awesome. Go ahead, buddy. Hello to everybody. I'm Damien from Bulgaria. I'm a professional wrestler, so I can, uh, I'm very respected by you, sir. Um, my question to, uh, to Dustin is, when you were an amateur trying to make it to the professionals, what was your mindset like? And also, when you made it to professionals, how did you balance between your professional life as a fighter and also family life? Thank you. 
when I was an uh, amateur working my way up, I just knew I had to get in front of the... Now, the landscape has changed. MMA is such a big sport now that guys are kind of picking and choosing fights to make sure they build up their record. But for me as an amateur, I wanted to fight the best guys. I didn't want to fight the guy with the losing record. I wanted to fight the best guys, build my name up, and try to make it in the UFC or get a call from the UFC. Um, so, so that's what I did as an amateur. I took the toughest fights I can get. And I also, in the back of my head, knew if I made mistakes in these fights, that it's gonna, my record is going to be back to zeroed out when I turn pro. So I wanted to learn as much as I could before I made that step into professional fighting. I wanted to make mistakes as, and, and, and Very get better. So I tried to fight a little bit longer against tougher guys as, a, as an amateur before I made the decision to turn professional. So did you take more risks as an amateur? Because you're like, let me just see if I can do this or not. I took more risk because I needed to learn, and I knew in the back of my head that it was, my record was going to be zero. Great. When what I, a mindset. When I go pro. Fantastic. So you're starting zero and zero, so it's not like a... Yeah, it's, it, we wiped that away. No, we don't talk about amateur records. You know, no, we, nobody we knows talk about professional, records. Yeah. professional records. And then, obviously, when you go pro, then you want to fight guys that, that yeah, favorable matchups, yeah. build your name up, and then fight the best guys mm. in the world. But as an amateur, I had the opposite of mindset. I wanted to fight the toughest guys. Sick. <laughs> Sick mindset. Tamara. Tamara. She asks very technical questions, so we're hoping it's less than 15 seconds. Funny you say that. I have so many questions. Maybe I can ask guests the questions next time, if you allow me. No problem. <laughs> you are hired. I believe in you. So I'm a huge UFC fan. I grew up watching UFC on the weekends. And um, when I was thinking about what kind of question to ask, well, first of all, I have so much respect for you, Dustin, and for everyone who works and fights in the UFC, because not only you give it all financially, you also give it all health-wise. So, so much respect for you. Thanks. My question, um, does everybody know who Donna White is? Okay, so I was watching Donna White's interview on Candice, and one thing that he said is, when my guys fight in the octagon, I don't care who they think, Allah or Jesus, who they believe in, Democrats or Republicans, how come is that the most violent industry in an octagon is so peaceful in a political arena? That's a tough question, man. <laughs> And the question is for you both, Patrick and Dustin. I didn't hear the second part. Uh, the question is for both of you guys, if Patrick also wants to answer. I think he's qualified. I'm just going to comment it, please. Great question, by the way. It is. I think it's such a um, diverse talent pool from fighters and athletes from all over the world that there's no room for, you know, for hate or for uh, everybody's coming from around the world and fighting in the UFC. It's not like a, a one country sport. So many walks of life, so many religions. How, how could they have barriers? You know, you can't. When, when every, everybody's so different in fighting and, and they, they, they couldn't put up barriers. That, I think that's why everybody just accepts each other. And by the way, if it happened, it happened a little bit on the Conor fight with Khabib, right? There was a little bit of that. And that was. The, the UFC world was not happy about that. They yeah. were not supportive about that. Like, listen, you can call out a lot of things. Wives, you know, certain things got to be off limits. And Conor breaks all of those rules, by the way. Yeah, that, that's definitely crossing the line. Yeah. Great question, Tamara. Okay, anybody here on CEOs, founders? Like, go, let's go over here. Uh, Leo, if you don't mind running, like, yeah, just go over there, bud. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you. All right, that's fine. Let's have him ask the question. Okay, cool. Thank you, Leo. So my, my, my question is uh, in reference to emotions. So how important is controlling your emotions in the octagon? In the octagon or, again, how, how do you process that? I know a lot of times in the business world we get good news, but more times than not we have to deal with bad news. It, it's, for me, I'm an emotional person. So, you know, I'm very emotional f a fighter, and I try to use that to work for me. But... There's been so many fights that I've been over emotional and, and that, that, blind, that has blinded me and, and made me bad, make bad mistakes during the fight. Kind of like a, just so angry that I'm doing things that, that I shouldn't. Uh, I'm getting away from technique because I'm fighting on emotion. But I, I had a trainer tell me one time a after a fight that these emotions are like a fire. Like you, you can use them, they can burn you or you can use them to, to cook your family's meals. And, and I kind of took that with me. Wow. And I'm just trying to, to use that fire to, 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 to push me forward in training, to push me, to make right. me focus. Because before I walk out there and fight, when I'm in the locker room, I'm, just, I'm nervous. 
and I'm scared, but I just, over these past years of fighting on such big stages and so many times, I realized that it's okay to be nervous and scared. I'm supposed to be because my body is preparing itself to do something great, you know. Greatness should, should make you nervous and, and make you scared and make you emotional. So I just try to embrace it. I'm not absent to it. I'm just acquainted with those feelings. I'm not absent to it. I'm acquainted to those feelings. The level of depth on your answers, uh, Dustin, this is just great. Right there. Go ahead. Hey, Dustin. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you talked earlier about your uh, camp and how you kind of do the peak week. And I'm also a competitive bodybuilder. And as Pat said, the prep is kind of similar in many ways. So as you go through prep and intensity kind of builds up mm -hmm. and the uh, emotional, you know, I guess tension and the fatigue and everything kind of builds up, especially if things in life around you really kind of apply pressure, I would say. Yeah. Do you have any systems, things you do, or that you think of besides that thing with the circle that keeps you focused, that makes sure that you're always on point, making the right choices, the right decisions, so you can come to the fight as best as you can, so you could perform the highest level? and win the fight. Yeah, I think we just have to, for, for me, the circle you said, but if you know your why, like if you wake up every day knowing, oh, I want to be the world champion, but that's just part of it. I, I, I'm a provider, and I want my daughter to grow up and have things I didn't have. I want my wife and daughter to be in a safe spot. I think that is my driving force that pulls me back in. Because as, as it ends, training camp starts to end, and, and I do start peaking, I, I I, I do get, things do, you know, bother me more. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be laser focused on this day coming up because we have a date circled and every day is a day closer. I'm, I'm worried about am I prepared enough that I do everything I could possibly done. But that why is, is I'm going to go out there and do whatever I need to do because I have a wife and daughter at home. And I'll do, I'll, you know, that, that's, that's what I pull back to. That helps me. I don't know if you have something like that that anchors you, but that's my anchor. You know, I, I would do whatever it takes to, to make sure that they're good. We're going to do one more here, and then we're going to wrap up right here to the left. Last question. Hey, D Dustin. Dustin. My name is Juan Martinez, and, uh, you know, I just want to tell you, you know, when you kick my, uh, my, the, the Irish guy's ass, <laughs> uh, I was so happy to see and just shut his mouth. And, uh, you know, but your humbleness, your humbleness after the fight, you mentioning your foundation, it really got to me. As an immigrant, I came to this country when I was 16, and it was people like you that make donations. Uh, you know, I didn't have any family or nothing, and the American people were very generous, you know, and I received donations. Now I'm in a different position. You know, those people impacted me uh, as a child, and here I am, you know, I own a company successful along with my wife, and I wanted to, on behalf of my family, make a thousand dollar donation to your foundation so you could uh, Thank continue you, man. to help those people. Thank awesome. you so much. It does make a difference. And awesome. I would encourage anybody else, you know, let's raise ten, twenty thousand dollars for his foundation. Awesome. Anybody that. Thanks, buddy. Uh, 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 gang, first of all, how many guys had a blast with Dustin? Let's make some noise for Dustin. Thanks, man. I got two gifts for you. I got two gifts for you. Can we get the gifts, please? So which one's this one? I know what this is. This is the bottle. Of the and what's this one? This one is the actual liquor. This is, the this is a what? This is the actual whiskey. This is the bottle that is branded. Okay. All right, got it. So I'm going to give them this here. First of all, we, we know you like this. You may want to open it up and see what it is. I think you'll like that. Um, this is also, you want me to open this one? Yeah. Okay. So you're a whiskey guy, no? I am. So we got you some nice whiskey for you. Oh, you're the man. Thank you And so then much. we got you. You want to open this up so we can show them what this is? And then outside of this, I got one other gift for you. Hang on. So we got a nice little custom bottle for you to put your whiskey in with Value Tamer for coming to oh, the man, conference. A nice decanter. Thank you so much. And on top of that, brother, we love you so much. Thank you. On the charity side, I personally... I mean, obviously, we, you, you came over here. This is not like you're selling anything. This is not a pitch fest, but $20,000 from you to your charity to support what you're doing. Seriously, what you're wow. doing, wow. we support you, brother, and we're going to encourage everybody else to support and figure out how to do that. We got $20,000 from us to you. That's Thank true. you so much. Make That's some noise. Right. Dustin Poirier. Thank you. 
So Dustin Poitier, how he mentally gets ready for the fight with the whole circle, what he can control, what he cannot control. Curious to know what you took away on what he said about uh, Connor. Like, is Connor still in a position to fight? And the fact that he thinks he can fight anybody, who you think he needs to face off next? Comment below. And if you enjoyed this interview, I think you're also going to like the interview I did with Mike Tyson. And Mike probably told some stories I have never heard before. So if you want to watch that, click here to watch Tyson's interview. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.